In the Western narrative, uh, the conflict, Boko Haram conflict, has been frequently presented as a religious war opposing Christian and Muslims. At IFRA Nigeria, we did a, um, a quantitative and uh, critical examination of the, of the available data. The analysis of combined data that we, what we found in the database uh, suggested that approximately two civilian victims out of three were Muslims. So it shows that um, uh, the media coverage of, uh, of the Boko Haram shaped the perception in a wrong way. Uh, it gave the conflict a, a, a wrong definition based on a religious confrontation. And it was particularly, dan particularly dangerous in the Nigerian context to, to engage in a debate over which community uh, were suffering the most. Because it served, actually it serves the, the strategy of Boko Haram, uh, aimed at fomenting antagonism. Uh, between Christian and Muslim. Of all the countries that have troops in Somalia, with the exception of Somalia, Kenya seems to have suffered more. But the question that I keep asking myself as a journalist, is the approach being used the right one? I have a concern in this country that we don't seem to look at the media, that it can also be used effectively to talk about alternative approaches. Because in this country, I can tell you, rarely do we have in the media a talk about alternative approach. It's only the hard approach. There is over expectation on the media, but there's not sufficient thought given to the question of how do you enable the media to actually play this outside role that everybody, including uh, people looking at counter-violent extremism, extremism uh, expect of the media. What are the main constraints that uh, media faces um, when, when facing, when dealing with um, the terrorism stories. There is minimal training about covering conflict. Yet, when you flip the coin, conflict is a common visitor across the country and across the region. When you give a platform to a terrorist group, when you play the Boko Haram video on your website, um, there's a, there's a, there's I think it's apparent that there is some kind of directionality, but maybe you can give us a little bit, we can start with you, LOD, um, a little bit of uh, a sense of what you see this directionality, how, how this kind of uh, dynamic um, plays out. Uh, Nigeria is a big country, and uh, you know, Lagos, uh, the economical capital, is, is, in, is located in the extreme southwest, and uh, the heart of the crisis is, 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 in, is located in the extreme uh, northeast, so they are just opposite. Journalists are supposed to 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 cover the the crisis uh, from a very uh, f from very far. They don't have much information. When you are based in Lagos, it's quite difficult to get information. Journalists in northeastern Niger Nigeria, they have information, but they 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 work and they, they, their work is really really hard. I mean. They can cover the, the, the crisis, but they can also be accused by the government of being uh, supporting Boko Haram. They can also be killed by Boko Haram because at some point Boko Haram also targeted journalists, as uh, Professor Kiari said this morning. We are in a different age. The moderated media's message and the unregulated, the vast unregulated media on social media and everywhere else, the gulf between the tone, the attitude is really striking. You know, the radicals have this alternative outlet that is completely unregulated, that they can say everything they want. And the problem is that increasingly, mainstream media becomes, you know, the, the youth become tone deaf. I think above the line, you still have the agenda setting role, you should still try to moderate, but then you must also think, how do you communicate in the language? that the young people understand. If we can talk a little bit more about the agenda setting power of the media in the context of terrorism and radicalization, is this a function that you think people are sufficiently conscious of? Is this a function that is being performed well? Um, or is this just something that uh, is kind of a space that's been abdicated or people, media doesn't realize how much scope it has? It's an issue that we give priority as media, that people tend to debate and focus. If we decide to prioritize certain issue, it becomes prominent. If we decide to downplay an issue, it's played down. When it comes to terrorism, it seems that media gave it the prominency, 
to the extent that Kenya sat and decided that we need to go to Somalia. So it's, it's, a, it's an agenda setting. When we distinguish between a terrorist group and a criminal gang and whatever, or, or you know, a freedom fighter, how do they treat women? I think that's one way of distinguishing it, because a group that has political ambitions, political aims, will not round up 12-year-old girls for sexual assault or to hand them out as sexual favors. Um, and that's something that I would like to encourage people to think about. If in this country would label every criminal by the religion, you know, I, I don't know what will, the list will look like. Eh? So m my view is this. A terrorist is a terrorist, regardless of the religion. But I don't know why the media is always uh, fond of, you know, that tag has always to be there. How economically independent are the media houses? The government can play that subtle card. You know, if you don't tell the line, we can pull out advertising. And uh, that, that, I think, is the critical issue that undermines media independence in Kenya. Can you run a proper media house when it's a for-profit organization? Maybe not.